all wars, some battles become famous while others are forgotten. Today I'm going to talk about a battle which is largely overlooked in Irish military history. In November 1600, during the Nine Years' War, a battle was fought outside Carlingford. The numbers on both sides were relatively small and there was no clear-cut victor. What was important was that it was between Hugh O'Neill, whose military and political skill had turned a provincial rebellion into a war that covered the entire island of Ireland, and Lord Deputy Mountjoy, the English commander who would finally defeat O'Neill and bring an end to the war, but at an appalling cost. By 1600, the war had been underway for several years and England had already spent a fortune and lost thousands of men in Ireland. Mountjoy would ultimately win the war at Kinsale, but at this stage it was still far from clear that England would triumph. Mountjoy had arrived in Ireland at the beginning of the year and made an enormous difference very quickly, pushing back Hugh O'Neill's supporters in much of Leinster, while Henry Docker had landed with a force in Loch Foyle, and in the south of the country, Carew quickly won control over most of Munster. However, in Ulster, O'Neill was still strong, and Mountjoy was under pressure to move north. In September 1600, Mountjoy marched from Dublin with the aim of establishing a garrison in Armagh. However, O'Neill was waiting in the Moray Pass, the main route into northeast Ulster. For a number of weeks, in horrendous weather, Mountjoy's army tried and failed to break past O'Neill. In the end, Mountjoy fell back. However, then O'Neill also did so, allowing Mountjoy to quickly race through the pass with his army and reach Newry. His men were in no condition to reach Armagh, so he contented himself with building a new fort in Mount Norris, proclaiming O'Neill a traitor, again, and telling the world that he had defeated Hugh O'Neill. Then it was time to return to Dublin. O'Neill, however, had other plans, and was determined to show that he was far from beaten. With 400 or so men, plus some cavalry, O'Neill moved back into the Moray Pass, almost daring Mountjoy to attack him. However, Mountjoy did not want to risk a further confrontation with O'Neill in the pass, so, in a reversal of roles, despite outnumbering O'Neill, Mountjoy refused to attack him. Rather than returning to Dublin through the Moray Pass, he decided to go via Carlingford. On 12th of November, Mountjoy crossed Carlingford Lock at the aptly named Narrow Water, where the lock, or really at this stage the Newry River, is very narrow. Josiah's Bodley was sent across first with 300 selected men to protect the rest of the army. However, while the infantry, or the foot as it was called, were sent across in boats, it was discovered that the current of the river was too strong for the cavalry, referred to as the horse. These accordingly had to return to Newry and then follow a trail along the southern side of the Newry River to catch up with the rest of the army who were encamped near Narrow Water. Illustrative of the weak state of the English army, in the two days before the crossing the soldiers had eaten little but butter, cheese and biscuit. O'Neill had not been idle while this was going on. His scouts would have been shadowing the English force and he would have received reports about where they were going. He decided to make Mountjoy fight his way to Carlingford. The Gaelic forces were much more mobile and faster than the English. They also knew the terrain well. Taking advantage of this, O'Neill was able to move his forces rapidly from the Moria Pass to near Carlingford. He appears to have gone to Lislea and Ballantyskin Skin before taking a position near Two Mile Water below what is now called Slee Foy and Eagle's Rock. As well as monitoring the English, O'Neill's men built entrenchments. As the English would discover the next day, O'Neill probably had only a few hundred horse and a few hundred foot with him, although the foot were supposed to be some of his best troops. Mountjoy outnumbered O'Neill, having at least four regiments of foot plus some horse. Probably he had around a thousand men. The following day, Mountjoy's scouts quickly discovered the whereabouts of O'Neill. Near Two Mile Water, now called Two Mile River, 
O'Neill had blocked the road to Carlingford. Probably this followed a route similar to the road running from Omeet to Carlingford today. The Gaelic soldiers built a number of entrenchments near the road and on a hill overlooking it. From the latter fortifications, the Gaelic forces could fire on the road below, but due to the terrain it was very difficult for Mountjoy's men to reach them. As the English vanguard approached O'Neill's positions, they came under heavy fire, which they returned. A fierce firefight broke out and continued for the next two hours. The battlefield was slowly covered by thick blankets of smoke, obscuring the opponents from each other. This helped the English, as they were in the open, fighting against an entrenched enemy. Also of help was a short range of the calibre musket, the firearm used by O'Neill and much of the English. This was 40 metres or less for an effective volley. After some heavy fighting, the detached wings and the vanguard of the English force managed to drive the Gaelic soldiers out of their lower trenches blocking the road. This allowed the army to keep moving and to pass O'Neill's positions. However, using their superior mobility, O'Neill's forces then switched their focus to the rear of the army, attacking Samuel Bagnall's regiment. However, they continued to the skirmish switch and harassed the entire English force. At the rear of the column, in fierce fighting, the English officers only kept the Gaelic soldiers at bay by charging with the colours. As the fighting continued, part of Morrison's regiment was sent back to support Bagnall. Ultimately, it took a charge from some cavalry led by Henry Davers to drive back O'Neill's men. Davers was wounded in this attack, though. Finally, the fighting died down and Mountjoy's shaken force made its way to Carlingford. Mountjoy claimed that he had won, also saying that the battle had only lasted half an hour. This is not true. The battle took much longer, probably between two and three hours. Various English reports give a good idea of the nature of the fighting. In one account, the anonymous writer said that he had been shot through the cloak and that his horse had been killed under him. Furthermore, Mountjoy's secretary, Cranmer, was also killed in the fighting. As was usual in this war, the casualty reports had to be treated very cautiously. Fines Morrison gave the government casualties as 20 killed and 60 wounded, compared with a supposed loss of 200 for O'Neill. Another source said Mancha had lost 10 killed and 60 wounded, as against 80 dead on O'Neill's part. Needless to say, these figures are somewhat dubious, as the English force had to fight its way past entrenched opposition. Indeed, they are more related to the battle Mancha was fighting in London, in which he was attempting to construct a version of himself as a victorious general. By way of contrast, Ralph Lane, the muster master and arrival of Mountjoy, gave a much higher and perhaps more accurate casualty figure. He says 80 were killed, plus 10 special men of mark. However, Lane also exaggerates the size of O'Neill's force, saying he had 1,500 shot and pikes. Lane also criticised Mountjoy for not having secured the Mori Pass or building forts to hold it. His digs at the Lord Deputy illustrate that despite the latter's bluster, he returned to Dublin with a chastened force, probably very relieved to have made it back. Mountjoy was Elizabeth's best general in Ireland during the Nine Years' War. However, there was nothing inevitable about the outcome of the war at that point. Even though the Battle of Carlingford cannot exactly be described as an English victory, Mountjoy deserves credit for the way he handled his army. He kept his men together and managed to get past an entrenched enemy, even driving the Gaelic soldiers out of some of their trenches. O'Neill used tactics that had worked very well for him previously, notably probing attacks in different parts of the opposing force. Mountjoy, though, had kept control over his army, not allowing it to be destroyed piecemeal as had happened on previous occasions, notably at the Yellow Ford. It should also be noted that both forces were much smaller than in many other battles during the war, and that O'Neill was outnumbered.
Although it also cannot be described as a victory for O'Neill, he probably achieved what he wanted from this action. He did not have sufficient numbers to inflict a crushing defeat, but he had showed Mountjoy that his men could still fight, and despite being outnumbered, they handled their government opponents very roughly. Indeed, Frederick Jones, Mountjoy's biographer, admits this. Quote, The ensuing struggle lacked nothing in ferocity when compared with that at the Mori, and it was a badly mauled English force which eventually got back to Dundalk on the following day. End quote. A few days after the battle, Mountjoy arrived back in Dublin, claiming to have achieved great things since September. He even said that the back of the rebellion had been broken. In relation to the end of the conflict, Mountjoy was very wrong. However, it's worth asking what he had actually achieved. Despite the new fort in Mount Norris, he had failed in his main objective of establishing garrison in Armagh. Nor had he defeated O'Neill in battle. Furthermore, the cost of his expedition had been heavy, not just financially, but also in terms of manpower. The fighting had exhausted his field force. Indeed, the whole campaign came very close to breaking the army, as James O'Neill has pointed out. Mountjoy claimed to have restored morale to the army, and that he was helping to instill in it a sense of purpose and the belief they could beat O'Neill. This somewhat contradicts the impact of the campaign on his army. The atrocious conditions in the Mori Pass cannot have been good for the morale of the army, nor can the losses in men, whether battle casualties, sick or desertions, or the weakness of the army upon its return to Dundalk. However, when Mountjoy and others talk about the morale of the army, what do they mean? not of the army as a whole, but rather its leaders, the officers. The confusion of the end of the Essex era was replaced by much clearer direction under Mountjoy. Unrestricted warfare and constant campaigning were very much to the taste of the more junior officers, especially when there's no longer a need to be concerned with the faction fighting in London. In this sense, Mountjoy raised the morale of the army by to paraphrase a very appropriate expression of Shakespeare, apparently written in 1599, unleashing the dogs of war. The morale of the poor misfortunates who made up the rank and file did not really matter, as long as it did not copy the tercios of Flander and mutiny. Mountjoy was thus able to mould a new army. He badly damaged this new army in the campaign. However, his ability to produce a largely univocal narrative and to impose silence on what was happening in September and October limited the impact of this. In turn, this allowed him to claim victory and to say that he had driven O'Neill from the Mori Pass, even though O'Neill actually returned to the pass in September, forcing Mountjoy to return from Osa by Carlingford. Nevertheless, Mountjoy was reasonably successful in his counterfactual narrative. However, the most important impact of the campaign was that it helped build Mountjoy's reputation in the court as a winning or always victorious general. This reputation was built on top of the suffering of his own men and that of the Irish, yet this mattered for little. Under pressure before the campaign, Mountjoy knew that he needed a victory to protect him from the whims and vagaries of Elizabethan politics. That he invented this victory paying a heavy price for it, did not matter. What mattered was that Elizabeth had to receive news of a victory.